Coming Back is a listener-supported podcast. To support the show and receive weekly grief guidance from me, monthly group grief support calls, and the first look at upcoming books, courses, and projects, become a patron now at patreon.com slash Shelby Forsythia. Just $3 a month gets you access to everything there is to see on Patreon, plus connection to a beautiful group of grievers just like you. Unlock grief support now for $3 a month and support this show at patreon.com slash Shelby Forsythia. A special thank you this week to Mary Ellen for becoming a supporter on Patreon. And thank you so much for listening. What if you could improve your relationship to grief a little bit every day? If you're looking for comforting words and practical exercises condensed into one small paragraph each day, check out my new book, Your Grief, Your Way. It's a non-religious daily devotional that helps you get in touch with your heart and your grief for a full 366 days. Find Your Grief, Your Way now on Amazon, Audible, IndieBound, Barnes & Noble, or anywhere else you buy books. And stay tuned to the end of this episode for a special excerpt from Your Grief, Your Way. Hi there, and welcome to Coming Back, a podcast about coming back to life after death, divorce, diagnosis, and more. Today, I'm talking to osteopath, doula, and zero balancer Avni Trivedi, who joined me all the way from London to talk about moving the body in grief. Today, we'll talk about how the body grieves even years after a loss how to cope with physical separation during COVID-19, and how to move the feeling of being stuck by moving the body. I'm Shelby Forsythia, an intuitive grief guide and author who speaks, writes, and teaches powerful truths on grief and loss. My mom's death in 2013 set me on the path to becoming a lifelong student of grief and I use what I learned to create a world where grief is welcomed, normalized, and even embraced. Because even through grief, we are growing. Let's get started. Hi there, grief growers, and welcome to another episode of Coming Back. I am so glad to be here with you today. Just a quick announcement here at the top of the show that I've just listed a new collection of workshops. These are 90-minute Zoom workshops if you would like to be a part and join with us over on my website, shelbyforsythia.com slash events. The first of which is actually happening tomorrow, October 15th, and it's Release the Pain of Guilt. This is a repeat workshop because it had uh, such success the first time and so many people were interested in it that I'm running it again. Uh, and there's another one, a new one this Saturday, let go of perfectionism in grief, and three more, including sit and stay in painful emotions, express anger in grief, and navigate anticipatory grief. And these are all happening between now and the first week of November. So if this is interesting to you, and you'd like to sit in with um for about 90 minutes or so with me and some fellow grievers in a private non-recorded Zoom room. I'll take your questions and listen to your law story personally and really custom tailor an experience for you surrounding this main theme, whether it's perfectionism, whether it's guilt, whether it's anticipatory loss. So literally who you are and what your loss is, as well as who the other people are in the group and what their losses all inform the direction and the conversation and even the tools and the kinds of healing that happens in these spaces. And in the past, gosh, we've had these beautiful conversations about what it means to surrender when really big, large emotions like despair or hopelessness or anxiety get in the way. And we've also had conversations too about the fact that guilt really never goes away, but it can often be perceived as a messenger instead of as a threat or as a bully. And these are just such beautiful ways to reframe grief, especially if you're struggling with a specific topic like perfectionism, anxiety, and anticipatory loss, etc. So if these are interesting to you, I have a limit of six attendees per session, so we can really go deep on everybody's stories. And again, you can find all of that at shelbyforsythia.com slash events. In addition to those, I'm also appearing live uh, in a couple of different places to promote the book Your Grief Your Way. So if you'd like to join me for free for some panels and some um, 
really fun Q and A's with other people in the grief sphere. I would love to have you. Um, on October 19th, I'm going live with David Bailey on Facebook. And so if you have a Facebook account, I would love if you joined us there and pop some questions into the chat. And then coming up for everyone listening in the UK, I'm really glad to tell you about this. Uh, the Good Grief Festival in Bristol uh, is hosting a panel called Am I Grieving Right? And believe it or not, grief growers, I am waking up at 3am Pacific time so I can be on this panel at 4am Pacific time, which is 11 a.m. Greenwich Mean Time. Uh, and I'm so excited to be a part of this panel with Dr. Julia Samuel, who's been a guest on uh, Coming Back Before Way back in season two. She's written the book called Grief Works. And we're going to be talking about, am I grieving right? Am I grieving correctly? Am I grieving appropriately? Which is a question so many of us ask in grief and loss. And what does it really mean to grieve right? And that's happening on October 30th, so the day before Halloween. And I am so looking forward, truly I am, to waking up that early and meeting so many of you from across the pond. And for what it's worth, because this is an online event, it's open to everybody everywhere. But if you're in the United States, it might be a little early for you. But if you're uh, in the UK, even if you're over uh, in Asia, and possibly even on Australia too, this might be a really great uh, opportunity for you to listen in to something that's live with me, because I know many of the things that I do are so late here uh, in the United States time that it's impossible for you to attend. So I'm hoping that you'll be able to, and this is free, 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 a free panel. And again, it's called the Good Grief Festival, Am I Grieving Right? And you can find, again, all of that information is at shelbyforsythia.com slash events. And now my interview with Avni Trivedi. Grief Growers, I'm really delighted to introduce you to Avni Trivedi, who knows a lot about grief and where it lives and how it lives in our bodies. Um, Avni, welcome to Coming Back. And if you could please share your loss story or your relationship to grief with us. Oh, that's a big question. Um, <laughs> it is. <laughs> we'll go right out of the gate. I, I know that from a really young age, I was exploring grief and what it meant to die and was asking those kind of big questions that parents probably don't really want to have to answer. And I've had multiple bereavements over the years. So um, I come from an Indian background and we had um, an extended family and both of my grandmas at different times shared a room with me and both died, one when I was 14 and one when I was 17. Um the one who died when I was 17 probably hit me kind of hardest in terms of bereavements over the years um, because she had a stroke and I woke up in the night to her having a stroke and with blood coming down her face. Um, and then she ended up in hospital for a few days. Um, and it was just at that time of life of um, in the UK doing a level. So it's our kind of high school certificate and not wanting to be at school while she was lying in a coma. Um, and also not having much understanding, especially losing a grandparent in some cultures wouldn't be such a big deal because you're not expected to be that close to your grandparents. But from my perspective, it was so devastating. And then over the years, there have been some consecutive ones of a really close friend who was killed in a car accident. Um, a close auntie who had a very rare brain um, disease and died within a year, which was a huge shock. And most recently, a very close cousin who died again in a car accident. So it's been, yeah, lots of cumulative ones over the years, rather than one big significant one. Yeah, and I think that almost... Um well, if I can phrase it in like a twisted way, it almost grounds us to have more loss than less loss because it's not one giant disaster. It's like, oh, this is happening quite a lot. It's not like we took uh, one leg off a of one-legged stool. It's like we're taking off multiple mm -hmm. supports from something that has a lot underneath it. I'm not exactly sure what I'm trying to get at here, but, but um, when we lose a lot of people, it kind of reinforces that idea of like, okay, loss is universal. It continues to be life changing. Um, and it continues to happen. And it's enormously frustrating and cumulative. But yeah, so I wonder, um, with this first loss, the loss of your, your grandmothers, can you speak more on like the importance and the significance of extended family and perhaps why those losses are still 
valid because I think you touched on something significant in like American culture. We're like, oh yeah, grandparents, <laughs> blah, blah, blah. Um, but especially in other parts of the world or in other cultures, like grandparents are such cornerstones of the family and it's heartbreaking to lose them. Yeah, and especially the proximity of having shared a bedroom. It's like there's a closeness of, especially with the one who died when I was 17, there was a lot of tending to her and combing her hair and giving her asthma pump and things like that. So that kind of loss is a real physical loss as well. Um, and I felt split in two cultures because in, in my culture, you're kind of friends and family will come over and they're there to support you in grief but I actually found it such an imposition because all these people would be in our house and we had sheets on the floor so people are sitting on the floor and they're just kind of not really saying anything and I just couldn't quite understand like how is this supposed to be helpful and why am I making tea Mm. for these people when I'm the one who's going through loss so it actually brought up more anger and irritation then I found it helpful yeah there's kind of a resentment of like (laughs) if you're going to show up do something (laughs) make yourself (laughs) useful (laughs) can you get me my tea I don't make you your tea oh my gosh that's really funny I don't know that I've ever heard that before I have heard I'm familiar with this idea of like people came over they just sat on the couch and stared at me and it wasn't helpful at all um but then this idea too of of you know I, I wish they just go away. I don't know how this is supposed mm-hmm. to be helpful. Yeah, this mm-hmm. questioning of what's the point? And I think that comes up a lot um, in grief too. So thank you for sharing that. Um, I want to uh, dive into this area of kind of what happens to our identity and role in the household when someone in our immediate family dies, because it sounds like um, there was a lot in your identity or who you were about caretaking for your grandmother's. And so when they died, it's like those physical movements, giving her asthma medication, helping with her hair, things like that. It's like those movements cease. And it's almost like, where does that energy go or, or how else does it manifest? Yeah, I never thought of it in that way. Yeah. Yeah, that takes me so far back. It's, it's kind of bizarre to think in, in that way. But yeah, there's the kind of unspoken, just everyday almost monotony that just suddenly isn't there so yeah where does that go it reminds me a lot of um when i used to do grief workshops in person back when we could do things in person (laughs) at least here in the united states um i had a, a widow stand up and tell me she said one of the hardest things for me was switching my identity as one of a caregiver for my husband to no longer a caregiver she's like i don't know what the next thing's going to be but to grieve that identity in addition to grieving him was enormously hard because there's something that happens when we are the physical Mm -hmm. caretakers for the people in our lives. Yeah. And that just really resonated with me because for me personally, I don't have very close relationships with my grandparents. A few of them uh, died before I was born. One died when I was in fifth grade um, and the other one lives far away. So it's not something where, I'm very actively in their lives. And even with my other family members, my dad, my sister, I'm not physically proximity close to them. Um, And so there's not a lot of that grief that would appear. So it's just interesting um, to think about. But I want to pivot to your work and and talk about how you got into studying the body um, and then how you decided to incorporate grief in it, if that was a decision at all, or if you just came in knowing that grief belongs here. Um, I... I got interested in studying the body by studying originally physiotherapy or physical therapy, as you'd say, in the States, and then getting into more kind of healing techniques like hands-on healing and shiatsu and um, and Reiki and the more kind of spiritual aspects of of healing techniques, Um, and then trained as an osteopath because I I wasn't happy doing physiotherapy anymore. And after doing a paediatric training in osteopathy, I decided to become a birth doula. And my aim was to support women in birth and then also be able to treat them in their in their kind of pregnancy and postpartum. And for many doulas, because you're you're kind of helping life to come into the world, there's also that thinking of death as well. So I think it's it's almost like the 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 
the birth keepers are also the honorers of the rituals and the rites and, and death. So it's philosophically and spiritually always felt a really relevant part of what I do, even though actually working with loss and grief has only really been in the last three years in my kind of professional capacity. Oh, but that's a really familiar sentiment of I work in birth, therefore I also work in death. Mm. And even if it's never said out loud, when people tell me um, um, here in the US that they're like OBGYN nurses or or doctors or things like that, I'm like, ah, so you work in death care. Mm -hmm. And not necessarily all the time, mm -hmm. um, but there's this, yeah, kind of lingering like in the back of your head as that always sits there too. Mm. Yeah. Even if you're not seeing death in the moment, but something else is dying as something else is arriving. Totally. And it's one of the bits of working in kind of pregnancy and women's health that doesn't get talked about enough that if you're supporting life, unfortunately, you're also working with loss a lot of the time. And the amount of women who've had miscarriages or baby loss um, or going through fertility treatment and had that type of grief, it's it's really it's there and it's in the body and it doesn't get talked about enough and the things that are available you know are questionable of how effective they are so there's just you know I, I think if you're working in that field you can't help but be be touched or affected or impacted yeah well and it reminds me of one of the very first episodes of coming back we did was with Corin Holmes who's a um, writes about miscarriage in Australia I believe um, and on the show we talked about, and I had never heard it phrased this way before, but but miscarriage or the loss of a baby is one of the few or only losses that happens within the body. It's not just the fact that the loss occurred, but I am the location where the loss happened. Yeah. Um, and that, I mean, talk about identity shifting yeah. is a whole, you know, if you'll pardon the expression, like a mind fuck, that'll really mess with your yeah. your head and your perspective on your story and and who you think you are, but then what the world around you is also. Mm -hmm. um, if I am a place where death takes place yeah. or has taken place, maybe not continuing to take place, but if I am a place where death is actively happening, what happens then? Yeah. I wonder, um, you teach this workshop, is it called Moving Through Loss? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Tell me more about kind of what you've seen with people you've worked with in terms of where grief lives in the body. Cause I think a lot of people perceive and know grief as heartbreak or maybe even brain fog, but so rarely attribute loss to an experience that physically happens. And I know people listening can't see me, but I literally just drew a whole, <laughs> a whole circle around my whole body. Um, and, and people ask me this question all the time of like, is grief a physical thing? Because I feel like garbage or my hands and legs are numb or I've been having heart palpitations or I can't get rid of this pain in my spine. Like there's, there's all these physical symptoms people have and yet so often people rarely speak about how and where grief shows up physically. I mean, that work came about from my experiences working hands on with people and just the body says so many things if you're really sitting and listening and there have been many times where I have felt something in somebody's body that's felt like it's older than the symptoms they're coming in with or grief sometimes feels like a kind of emptiness in certain parts of the body so typically like around the, the back of the heart the rib area grief energy just has like a slight dullness um, and it doesn't present in the same way in anybody. So, you know, it's really individual, but it can be things like around the heart area, just kind of collapsing inwards, like a heartbreak that like you were talking about. It can be that dullness I was saying in the rib cage. Um, if it's been an unexpected death or loss, then it can be in the diaphragm because shock can often get held in that part of the body. So it's from me kind of feeling things in treatment and then having dialogue about what could be the link and often it would be some form of big kind of impact or trauma um to then just wondering like okay how can I work with this because it's not efficient to work one-to-one -one. and especially with the bigger aspects of our life they often need ongoing work so I started to pull together different tools that I'd used myself over the years particularly for my own processes when I didn't find that counselling on its own was really enough 
Like it's just always felt like it's skimmed the surface for me. Um, and I guess as a body worker, because I so firmly believe that the mind and body are connected and it's part of a kind of Western approach where we keep on separating it, that it doesn't make sense. But, but yeah, that's how the, the approach came about. Yeah, uh, thank you. Um, and I, I love that you landed on there's places or energies that feel older in the body. Grief energy has a dullness. And it's such a strange thing when when you know and maybe the person that you're working on or working with, they they know, but maybe there aren't words for it yet. So I'm wondering if you've ever had to break the news to somebody or how you start having that conversation of like, there's something deeper here and I think it's grief in the body. I, I In the past, I've struggled with this because I felt, is it my place to be introducing that conversation because that person's coming in with something else? But then there's the other part of me that thinks if I can feel something in someone's body and my, my palpation or my sense of touch is pretty accurate, I think, or then that's the feedback I get given by clients that I think it's important if I can feel something about someone, I want them to also know it too it feels an imposition otherwise that I know something about them that they don't know for themselves mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I try to say it in quite a kind of open way without being you know they've not come in for therapy so that's not an agreement between us but I'll, I'll often just say you know this is what I'm feeling and these are the kind of things that can typically be related to it and then if that opens the conversation enough for them to want to respond great and if they don't great have you ever had an experience where somebody receives that and they're like, I don't, I don't want that news. I don't want that message. I've had a couple of times where people have kind of been a bit British about it. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what that means. <laughs> but then it's come up in later sessions that actually that did point to something. And it's not always such a clear loss either you know there can be things like say from there was one lady who comes to mind who last year she came in for treatment and her loss was related to redundancy that she wasn't expecting and it was a company that she really felt part of so it really stripped her how you were saying about identity it really stripped that away for her so it wasn't something in her consciousness she would consider a bereavement but it was yeah, well, and I think so much of, of loss and trauma in our bodies, too, is related to these things that aren't death. Yeah. Because they are so, I mean, we talk about identity as like the core of who we are. And then there's these places like the heart and solar plexus and the, and the sternum that are all so deeply connected to each other. Yeah. Or we speak about, I've lost my support system and all of a sudden I have back and shoulder pain. And I'm like, hmm, I don't, I don't think that's a coincidence what's happening there. Um, I, I kind of want to get into, I'm not sure um, how much literature you've read on like uh, the mind, body, spirit, soul connection, but I'm immediately thinking of like Louise Hayes, You Can Heal Your Life mm -hmm. and Carolyn Miss's Anatomy of the Spirit. Yeah. Um, I'm, Anatomy of the Spirit is one of my all-time favorites, but I wonder, um, has there ever been a, a point in time where you've been working with kind of the spiritual mind, body connection and thought, this needs more than kind of like the fluff side of it. It can be tempting to think that one resource is the answer for everything. As in, if I'm feeling pain in my shoulder, I must have a longstanding issue of feeling the weight of the world and I need to do mindfulness things to work that out. As opposed to, I need to see a doctor or I need to um, see a physical therapist or an osteopath or something like that. Um, so I wonder how you talk people off the ledge and into getting some kind of treatment instead of subscribing every single pain to some kind of uh, mental or spiritual connection? Um, oh, that's a good question. I think that even if it has a, even if their symptoms have an emotional root, in some ways it doesn't even matter what people do to access things or to try to make things better. It's the fact that they're doing something. So it could come from just some self-care practices or it could be doing something like I'm a big believer in creative pursuits as part of kind of self-care and, and feeling better because it's the, the expression, you know, just some, somewhere for the feelings to go. 
um, or just being in nature. So it doesn't have to be prescriptive, but it's just giving someone a sense of, okay, these are tools that could work for you. Or, And I, I particularly find that things that don't take very much time, because when someone's really in the thick of it, it takes a lot of energy to do something that's kind for yourself. So it could be something as simple as sitting and having a cup of tea undisturbed or having a few moments in the morning, just watching the sky or things like that, that just, uh, uh, you know, I think like the little accessible aspects make far more sense. Yeah. I love that because then it, it, um, I get this image of like being able to prop yourself up with mm. something more than like the one resource. Yeah. Um, which is really helpful. And that kind of contributes to that picture of holistic mind, body, soul, spirit, like all mm. these kind of ingredients coming together to contribute to wellness instead of I have this, so it must only ever be connected mm. to yeah. this. Um, yeah. Thank you for sticking with me as I got around to that question. I was like, <laughs> what are we really trying to say here? Okay. Um, yes. And I think I've seen this trend of some people having like one book on body and spirit and using it as their Bible. And I'm like, oh, I'm worried about you um, <laughs> in a way. Yeah. Because it, in some ways it means that this no longer works through the whole thing comes crashing down mm-hmm. and also other options are off the table for consideration. And there's so many ways to, as we talk about on the show, like come back, there's so many ways to come back from loss. Um, I wonder, you spoke earlier about um, the body says so much if we only sit and listen to it. Mm-hmm. And if I think grief is such a disconnecting experience that so often we have such a hard time plugging into our bodies again after loss. Uh, and I wonder if you have like some simple exercises or uh, mantras or practices that you use to re get into the body again after loss occurs. One really simple thing is just grounding. So either massage your feet or if you have someone that can massage your feet for you or standing on the gra- you know, on, on the grass or the beach, if you're lucky enough to be by the beach um, or have like a kind of a heavier blanket on your feet and legs. So you're physically feeling plugged into your body. Um, and trying to really tune into the skin as well, because I think if with loss, it's almost like a layer is taken off. So things are much more sensitive and people can have much more impact or stimulus can have much more impact. Like being in a noisy space can have far more irritation in your system than it would otherwise. So even just like how you tend to your skin, how you put something on, you know, using like a body butter or something, or just even having that visualization your skin is a barrier that keeps out the stuff that you don't want to let in and it's it's your kind of protection so you're not having to close in more than you would naturally when you're grieving you know some of it I think is just it just washes over us we can't control it and there's other things that you can do to connect again right yeah and I think that um Sometimes, especially for me, when I was grieving, I wanted to plug into my body and stay plugged in. Mm -hmm. When in reality, it was like, oh, no, I need to practice plugging in over and over and over again. It was like I'd plug the (laughs) I'd plug the cord into the outlet and then it would get yanked out again. I'd be like, oh, crap, I got to come back and plug this thing in and then it would get pulled out and you'll plug back in. Um, And it seems a little uh, relentless or um, unending of a process. But it kind of it kind of is to ground and reground and reground and recount and constantly be putting some kind of earth underneath our feet. I love the weighted blanket idea. To this day, the best gift that anyone ever gave me in grief was a weighted blanket. And it came two years after my mom's death, but I no longer struggled really with sleep after that. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, there's something safe about being that heavy. Um, the other question I kind of wanted to ask was if... A griever is in their body, but they're feeling absolutely just depleted, exhausted, stuck, end of my rope. I have I have awareness of my body, but I'm laying on the couch and not going anywhere, or I'm sitting in this chair and I haven't moved for three hours. So often I hear stories of one of my clients referred to it as being in frozen mode mm-hmm. and just in this place of I'm in my body, but it's not doing anything um i wonder if you can speak to that or maybe ways to to move through that experience because it feels from what it sounds like it feels so much like a stagnation that's just not got any movement to it at all 
if there's a stagnation often there's tiredness because things haven't been moving so a minute or two of physically moving the body like doing something like um I was going to say star jumps, but not as vigorous as that, just where the arms can really be moving. You can shake your arms, you can move your spine, just to let some energy go. And often there's a tiredness that's built up from things that haven't moved. But then once you let the movement happen, some real exhaustion can come through that needs the deep rest. So I think balancing Ah. the activity and rest. That's fascinating to me because it... um it's reframing the stuckness as like, well, maybe I'm not tired enough. Like maybe I need to really wear myself out and then I can sleep, sleep or, Mm -hmm. or have a nap or um, go sunbathe with my eyes closed kind of thing. But I got to really wear myself out first. Yeah. Cause I feel like it feels like being stuck at between this place of like, I have some kind of energy because I'm aware that I'm here. I'm very much in my body, but then, but I'm just not moving. And so to even set a timer for 60 seconds or, or 90 seconds. And some people have this gift. I can run in a loop around my house, <laughs> kitchen, living room, hallway, kitchen, living room, hallway, <laughs> um, and, and uh, run around or, or do a dance or something and then get to a real kind of tired that allows for rest. It's like climb the hill, the roller coaster, so you mm. can actually get to the descent yeah. um, as opposed to just coast, 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 coast the whole time. That's fascinating. I've never heard that before. Thank you. Yeah. Um, What has been one of your most interesting experiences with grief or trauma in the body and how it's shown up? For myself, personally, um, I had a I had a cough this is when I was training to be an osteopath and I'd had a bereavement and I had a cough that just kept on going and I it was quite a violent cough and it would make me throw up on a daily basis and I'd have to run I worked in an office where they had stairs and I'd have to walk run to the loo and go and throw up and it had just happened day in day out and being interested in alternative medicine I was trying lots of different things and I ended up seeing a homeopath who when she asked me what had been going on in the previous months she said oh this is a shock because of this bereavement that you've had and gave me a big dose of arnica for shock and it it changed that cough Um, and what's interesting is that I still get a seasonal what I call my grief cough every March which is when this death happened um so the kind of the history the story of the body is something that I find really interesting and I've, I've had so many experiences like that when I've been working with clients of what gets picked up or what comes up in conversation um but yeah just how powerful that just in that situation what was such unexpressed unexpressed grief or, or and because it was a bereavement where it was a really close friend but he wasn't my partner or he was my brother's best friend he wasn't my best friend so it was almost like the displacement because it wasn't my significant somebody but yet my system got so affected yeah and I think that really speaks to this um This notion or idea too, I'm thinking Bessel van der Kolk's book, The Body Keeps the Score, but it's almost like we have this clock that resets on January 1st of like, what grief events are we anticipating this year? And I've learned through the years that I have to take probably about December to mid-March pretty easy because that's when my mother died and then the months that followed up to her birthday. Um, But uh, I have... But gravers say, gosh, I'm always so run down around the end of the month. And I was like, when did your person die again? And they're like, oh, on the 27th. And I'm like, ah, something's happening here with that. And I think um, they're so attached. And I was speaking to um, Megan Devine in another episode of Coming Back. And we we spoke about how there's kind of two different ways that grief shows up in the body. Sometimes we have like phantom griefs or phantom pains, just like the person who died. And so it's almost as if we're so close to them, we mirror exactly what's happening. And then sometimes the total opposite happens where they die a certain way. And then we just 
have pain or, or disease or something else somewhere else in the body. But it's always really interesting to see how and where it shows up as a result of that. Um, I know we've mentioned a couple books on healing in the body. So I wonder if you have any other favorites that we haven't shared here. Um, gosh, I can't say Anatomy of the Spirit highly enough. I just love that book. Um, Eastern Body, Western Mind by Judith, um, Amadea Judith is a good one as well. Um, Body Wise um, by Hella and Henkin. And let me just scan the rest of my bookshelf. Sure, I know I see your eyes going. <laughs> <laughs> I do that too. Um, I can't remember the title of his book, but um, I practice an approach called zero balancing, and the founder is a man called Fritz Smith, and he his approach is on the energy and the structure of the body, but he's written um in a way that's really easy to understand about stored energy and stored kind of pain and tension in the body. I know we're in a place um, right now with COVID-19 where we're not able to see friends, family, coworkers, people that we'd normally touch. Um, So I wonder how we can get back in touch with ourselves when skin hunger or like a lack of touch is very, very present in the world. This can happen when we lose a partner or a very dear friend or a sibling, of course, but also right now in the age of COVID-19, I think. (laughs) I went to the grocery store the other day and somebody brushed up against my elbow and I was like, oh my gosh, that hasn't happened in like four months. (laughs) I was like, somebody just touched me. It was amazing. (laughs) Um, And there almost wasn't that recognition until that moment of like, holy cow, it's been so long since I've been able to hug somebody. Yeah. Mm. So what do we do when, um, when skin hunger or a very deep desire for touch, but an inability to have it is present? I mean, it is skin hunger is such a real phenomenon. And we also have our own hands that we can use touch for ourselves. So wearing things on our skin that feel lovely, wearing fabrics like cotton and bamboo or silk or things that feel really pleasing to the touch um even treating yourself to body products that actually feel nice to put on so I'm really fussy about like the feel of a serum or an oil or to me that's therapeutic in itself um and giving space to to really focus on touch so you know brushing your hair with attention so that can be a mindfulness exercise in itself so yeah unfortunately we're not getting that type of input from one another but there's definitely practices we can do for ourselves Um, and through this time I've been doing a little series on Instagram called touch notes and I share little um, kind of just ideas of very quick ways that people connect with that sense of touch because I I think it's something whilst I mean I'm a body worker and I recommend people go for body work but it's not something to outsource to other people either. It's have the capacity of putting our hands on our own bodies and having an effect. Uh, So it erases this story of I'm only able to access this from someone outside myself. Mm. Uh, And I've never heard that before either. And I think that's really beautiful because there's this perception that if I want to do this nice thing for myself, I have to book a massage once a month, or I have to go get a pedicure, or I have to go get a haircut or, or something like that, where I know I'm going to be touched by somebody else. And so it's almost like a, a guarantee, but we forget our own capability, like our own power in that too. The the, the power of just putting hands on, like I was, I was treating a little one week old baby this afternoon and it just always strikes me that there's a simplicity, you know, I've learned all these different techniques over the years, but it doesn't come down to technique. It's just the presence and attention of hands on. And that's enough. I think that speaks to grief work too, because at some point, no matter how much school you do or how many books you read or how much training you do, it's like, how are you showing up for, Mm. for people around you? Yeah. Oh my gosh. I love this idea of, a reclamation of that, that power in yourself. 
as you were saying about booking massages and things, you with grief, you don't always get the schedule of when you're going to feel certain things. So <laughs> That's it, right. <laughs> it, that kind of, you know, so to be able to do something for yourself when you need it in that moment, or at least that same day, is far more doable. And then if you get the bonus massage, wonderful, but you've also got things you can access yourself. Well, and I think part of it too, for people who are grieving, and I know this is true for me, is is as I'm brushing my hair or as I'm putting on lotion or something else, I also have to give myself permission to be mad that it's not the kind of touch that I want. Um, that mm-hmm. like, I know this is second best. I know it's not the thing that I'm really craving. I know it's not this. And my best is good enough for right now. So it's like, I have permission to be mad that I can't go hug my friends and I'm brushing my hair. <laughs> Um, and so it's like almost like letting those two things be true at the same time, um, especially when somebody we love dies and we're like, I can't share a bed with them anymore, but I can buy a really awesome body pillow off of Amazon, and stuff it under the covers or get an electric blanket or get a weighted blanket or something like that. And it's almost like um, it's okay to be mad at the substitute for touch as you're continuing to practice touch. Yeah. Yeah, a good friend of mine created a um, a brand when her father had cancer and was dying and then passed away. And she created a brand of restorative yoga props because she got so into restorative yoga that all she could do was like collapse onto her yoga pillows and things. And then that became a, a, a business for her in the end because it was just, that's all she could do. All she could do was just really flop. And so, you know, there is something of the the letting go and giving ourselves space to let go and just be with whatever we're feeling. And I love that word too. I just had the energy to flop. That's so true in grief too. Yeah. And so to create yeah, something. To hold it all together is hard, isn't it? I mean, for especially if you're only getting two weeks of compassionate leave where you're allowed to crumble and then you're expected to just carry on as normal. It's, it takes a lot of energy just to keep going. So to have the permission to flop on a regular basis, I think, is really important. Permission to flop. Well, and I wrote that down for you, too, as you were sharing your story at the beginning, is that you were at school while your grandmother was in a coma. And, and almost something like that reinforces this idea that keep calm, carry on, even when yeah. somebody that you love is in the process of dying. And so it's hard to go against something that starts when we're so little. Yeah, I mean, I remember with that situation, I was so angry at my school and it affected my motivation and it just made me just like, I don't care about these exams. So, you know, the school were putting all this importance of don't miss school because these exams mean so much. And actually they don't mean so much to me when this is going on in my life. So, um, yeah, the the expectation that we should just carry on is just, you know, sometimes there are more important things in life. I agree with you. And that brings me to this um, cliche that people toss around of like the best thing you can have in your health or above all, be grateful for your health or kind of these ideas that if you don't have health, you don't have anything. And yet um, myself included, so many people, especially when we're grieving, just kind of like, I don't need to worry about my health. There's other bigger things to pay mm-hmm. attention to. So I wonder if you found a different way or a different angle to look at this idea of like health as the ultimate foundation, because the, the old tired cliche of if you don't have your health, you don't have anything. It seems to just sail over people's heads anymore. I, I like the idea of getting some of the basics right like if you're not drinking water drink water if you're finding it hard to sleep at least get some rest in other forms obviously lots of people suffer from insomnia when they're grieving Mm -hmm. but there are ways of trying to get rest in your system um it's a good idea to not be having foods or beverages that are too much for your nervous system so you know this is the time for not trying to live on coffee or sugar and things which you know often that's what the body wants when it's had those kind of experiences but it does make the emotions harder to deal with so I think without 
trying too hard they're still so I, I think if with healthcare just have a certain amount of gentleness or softness so it's not standards that are hard to keep up with but just some basic things like say with nutrition often it's just really simple digestible comforting food that people need they might not feel that they need even to eat but that's the easiest kind of thing to break down so so yeah with with gentleness just to do the basics yeah and I think that way it doesn't seem um hmm. I'm grieving and I've given myself another mountain to climb like that yeah. kind of <laughs> perspective is like oh great another heavy thing to carry um which happens so often in grief um and I know before we got on the call today uh you had asked in terms of people who listen to coming back how many are grieving people themselves and how many are practitioners. And of course, there's no way for me to, to know that number definitively, but I do know there's a lot of uh, grief practitioners who listen to the show. So I wonder if you have some wisdom on how people who work with grief all the time can take care of their bodies as they're caretaking people who hold grief in their bodies too. I'm so glad you asked that because it bothers me that often people who are in caring jobs are dealing with other people's trauma and stories and then not having ways to really unwind that and release it. So it's so important to have ways. So um, I practice a, a movement method um, called nonlinear movement. And it's, it's like a moving meditation, which all you do is you are on your hands and knees with your eyes closed and your head dropped. And you just follow sensations in your body. So maybe you're moving a kind of achy area in your lower back or your shoulder, or maybe you're just feeling really sluggish and you just move whatever you're feeling at that time. So that's a really nice way of unwinding stuff. So I, I do that as a regular practice when I've been working or just, just to kind of go through the day. Um, having some aspect of space as well because often it's the kind of backing up of clients or rushing from one thing to the other or in these kind of COVID times where people are working on Zoom and then going from one meeting to the other like there's not enough buffer and it doesn't really matter what happens in that space it's just creating some form of space or margin or pause. Yeah and um uh, grief growers, I don't think I've ever shared this on the show before, but my, but my, um, my go-to is like, just go lay on the floor, <laughs> just go lay on the floor. <laughs> yeah. And I have to like, get, you know, get on the rug and like starfish, uh, starfish out. But something happens when I'm on the ground and I'm looking up at the ceiling and all of a sudden I'm like four or five years old again. And I feel like I have no problems, even though there's so <laughs> many, um, to worry about, of course. Uh, but just go lay on the ground. And I love this too, nonlinear, uh, did you say nonlinear meditation? Nonlinear movement. Nonlinear movement is what you'd said. Mm -hmm. um, thank you. Because I think so often <laughs> there's this pressure of like my life is structured, so my movement must be structured also. Uh, I, I exercise at this time or I um, get in the bath at this time or kind of whatever it is. And so there's permission to just like have a body and move it how it wants to be moved mm -hmm. um, instead of cramming everything into a schedule or if it's not in the schedule, it's not happening at all. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's really lovely because then again, it calls on what you're talking about earlier, this, this need to listen of if mm -hmm. the practice is nonlinear, then I'm required to tune in a little bit more mm -hmm. um, because there is no structure. There is no schedule to it. And so it requires a little bit more, um, <clears throat> like attention or presence. Yeah. And with an approach like that, the fact that there's only really two rules because all you have to do is close your eyes and keep moving something in your body, it gives a container, but it gives a lot of space for whatever there is there without judgment. So I think that's really important. Whereas if you're trying to keep up like a fitness regime, but you just haven't got the capacity, there's enough to then feel rubbish about yourself. Uh. So. There's a lot less shame involved. Yeah, and that's powerful in grief too. It's like, how can we take guilt and shame out of the equation? Mm -hmm. That's good stuff. Wow. Um, Abney, I wonder where can people find your work and sign up for uh, Movement Through Loss as well as any of your other classes related to the body? 
Um, I'm on Instagram and Twitter on at Avni Touch, and my website is Avni hyphen Touch. Avni spell A V N I. And I also have a podcast called Speak from the Body. Oh, I love that. So Grief Growers, since you're listening in a podcast platform right now, you can go find uh, Speak from the Body too. Pause this right now and go find it <laughs> wherever you are and get some more wisdom from Avni about uh, movement and the body and listening and tuning in. I just listened to one uh, most recently about how do you come back to life again after you've been on a pause or been on a break. And it's a powerful thing to do because we are cyclical creatures, but we often don't acknowledge it. And so there is an emergence after being gone for a while. And I thought that was so powerful. Um, Abney, thank you so much for coming on, coming back today and speaking to us about where grief lives, how it's expressed, uh, and how we can talk to it more in the body. Thank you. I've really enjoyed it. Thank you so much. So that's all for this episode of Coming Back. Thank you so much to Avni Trivedi for coming on Coming Back to talk about the power of noticing and healing grief through the body. Avni came back by treating her body with care and by helping others understand where grief lives in their own bodies. You can find out more about Avni's work, including her podcast, Speak from the Body, and her online grief course, Moving Through Loss, at avni-touch.com. And you can find that link in the show notes. You can find my new book, Your Grief, Your Way, 366 Days of Comfort and Practical Guidance After the Death of a Loved One, now wherever you buy books. And be sure to stay tuned after the credits for an excerpt from the book. If you'd like to get online grief support for just $3 a month, pledge to support this podcast on Patreon at patreon.com slash Shelby Forsythia. You'll instantly unlock access to weekly grief guidance prompts and monthly live calls with me. Our next live grief support call is happening Monday, October 26th at 5 p.m. Pacific. If you liked what you heard today, subscribe to Coming Back on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, and tell a friend about Coming Back, because you never know what someone you love is going through. Thank you so much to Addie Goldstein, who composed our theme music. You can find me on Facebook at Shelby Forsythia Intuitive Grief Guide, Instagram at Shelby Forsythia, or simply shelbyforsythia.com. If you'd like to leave a question or comment for a future show, email me at shelby at shelbyforsythia.com. As always, my dear grief growers, it was beautiful sharing this space and time with you today. I see you. I'm proud of you and the work that you're doing in the world. And I love you. Because even through grief, we are growing. Thanks for tuning in to this week's episode of Coming Back. Now, check out the October 14th entry from my new daily grief book, Your Grief, Your Way. October 14th. Be your own cheerleader in life after loss. Whenever you pass yourself in a mirror or see your reflection in a window, say to yourself, I'm rooting for you. I have faith in you. Or, I've got you. These small, simple phrases help you both acknowledge yourself as a grieving person and simultaneously recognize that you are your own ally in this new experience. Especially when you're sad or scared, meeting your eyes in the mirror and uttering the phrase, we're going to make it through this together, is intensely powerful. If this entry resonated with you and your grief, you can purchase Your Grief, Your Way now, wherever you buy books, including Amazon, IndieBound, Barnes & Noble, and your local bookstore. See you next week on Coming Back.